Cornerbacks, running backs, and quarterback are all positions experiencing major turnover for the Cincinnati Bearcats this upcoming season. You can add this position to that list. I'll tell you what that position is on today's episode of Locked On Bearcats. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen of every day. Welcome to a new week. Today's episode, Monday's episode, is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Alex Frank here, your host each and every day, bringing all of my experiences as a play by play announcer for Bearcats football, men's basketball, and sports weekly sports talk show host from Bearcast Media, UC student run media organization. Bringing all of those experiences here to the Locked On Bearcats podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the Locked On Bearcats YouTube channel, where at last check, we are up to 229 subscribers and counting. So don't forget to subscribe, follow us to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. So the position you can add to the list of positions on the 2022 Bearcats football roster experiencing turnover is the defensive line. So on today's show, I'm going to tell you why the defensive line is experiencing turnover. I'm going to tell you why I hope that the Bearcats defensive line this year can replicate replicate what the 2019 defensive line did. And I'm going to tell you about the one thing the Bearcats defensive line needs to do in order to be a success on this year's team, be a strength of this year's team. So let's get right into it. It feels like it's different this year with the defensive line because Curtis Brooks is gone. My Jay Sanders is gone. So the question I have is, can Malik Van and Jawan Briggs match the production from Curtis Brooks? Curtis Brooks was a monster last year on the defensive line. You're losing seven and a half sacks. You're losing 12 and a half tackles for loss. You're losing a forced fumble and fumble recovery. You're losing, he played in 13 of the 14 games. You're losing a stalwart on that defensive line. So the recruiting in the transfer portal that we've seen Cincinnati just, just absolutely nail the last four or five years really comes into play big time with the defensive line. You know, we're looking at Jawan Briggs, a transfer from Virginia, who we were all excited about at this time last year. We're looking at a guy like Malik Van, who has been a really good developmental player, but this year he's going to be more in the spotlight. We saw a Malik Van did last year. We saw him have three and a half sacks, eight and a half tackles for loss, three passes defended. He forced a fumble. He played in 12 of the 14 games. So that those are all stats to have you hoping he can have a big year this year. I mean, he's going into his fifth season with Cincinnati. He opted for an extra season with the bonus year of eligibility. And he's going to show why I think Jawan Briggs is going to show why he's got to be that you know, an anchor of this defensive line. He was a guy last year who you really didn't think a lot about, to be honest. It felt like, now obviously you had a lot of star players on the defense, but it felt like Jawan Briggs, for as highly touted of a transfer as he was, it kind of felt like he did get lost in the shuffle a little bit. You kind of forgot about him. Like, at one point I had to remind myself, oh, Jawan Briggs, I forgot about him. He really didn't start making an impact to me until the American Championship game when he was an absolute beast of getting to Houston quarterback Clayton Toon. But he's got to show why he was such a big pickup from, from Virginia. We're talking about a former you know, ACC defensive lineman. I mean, those are highly touted players. Now, my hope is that iron will sharpen iron. Let's not forget that this defensive line is going to be competing against the Bearcats' offensive line, going against them for you know almost a month out of camp higher ground. So there is going to be the opportunity for the iron of the offensive line, which is returning all five starters, to sharpen the iron of the defensive line, which is, you know, know, it it, it lost some bodies from last year. It's lost, you know, Elijah Ponder went after the 2020 season. Curtis Brooks went after last year. Same with Maya J. Sanders. So now you have to bring in that new guard of players. But going up against the offensive line in practice, I think it's the best way to do that. 
because we know this Bearcats offensive line is going to be really good. We know that it's a veteran group. So you have the opportunity to go against veteran offensive linemen in practice. So when you face an Arkansas or you face a, a UCF or you face an SMU, I'm not really worried about SMU because of what they did last year at the Bearcats defense, but when you face some big – Indiana, as an example, when you face a big-time opponent, whether it be in conference play or out of conference play or in the championship game, the bowl game, whatever, you'll be prepared and you can say, hey, we've gone up against our offensive line in practice. We're not scared of this opponent's offensive line. There's a lot of hope with guys like Jawan Briggs. Malik Van's different because I've seen it in a larger sample size over the years. I haven't really seen that from Jawan Briggs yet. And he just has to deliver on the field. This program is driven through its lines. We've seen players on those lines step up year after year on both sides. Van and Briggs will have to do the same this year. Because let's face it, Curtis Brooks is not walking through the door. Neither is Elijah Ponder. And you can go back to other guys over the years who have left. Kamani Fitz, Marquise Copeland, Cortez Broughton, anchors on the, on the defensive line who have left over the years. Marcus Brown's no longer here. Marcus Brown was a 6th year player. You know, he's another guy, too, who you didn't really think about all that often, but he was this big body in the middle who could get out, who could get to the quarterback if he could get a push up the middle. So it's going to be up to Malik Van and Jawan Briggs to continue that cycle of, we have these great players, they move on, we bring in these new, we bring on these new players that we've recruited, that we've developed, that have learned under you know, some great defensive linemen under great D-line coaches over the years. We've learned from these players. Now let's put them into, you know, the bigger spotlight. So up next, I'm confident that this defensive line can be really good. And I'll tell you why I think it can be a strength of this year's team. But first, I got to tell you about Bet Online because they are your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. You can find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL, Stanley Cup, Final, and Major League Baseball. At the time of this recording, uh, I don't know what happened in Game 6. The Stanley Cup could be won by the time you're listening to this tomorrow, or there could be a Game 7 on Tuesday night in Denver. Anyway, Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. So betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. So let me take you back to the first game of the 2019 season. The Bearcats are facing UCLA. Now, I was confident the Bearcats would win that game. I think a lot of people were. But there was one question I had going into that season. I think a lot of people did. I know I know it was discussed amongst the media. The defensive line. We knew after the 2019 season. We knew when the military bowl ended on New Year's Eve. We knew that Cincinnati's defensive line was going to be different. They were going to lose Kamani Fitz. They were going to lose Cortez Broughton. They were going to lose, you know, uh, Marquise Copeland. They were going to lose, you know, they, the only guy they really had returning was Michael Pitts. So there was going to, you know, we didn't really know who was going to step up. And you could try to pinpoint to one particular player. But what we saw in the UCLA game was, and I said this, this was one of, this is one thing I said on the broadcast of that game on Bearcast Media. That was the very first football game Bearcast Media ever did. And I said on air after a fumble recovery. I think it was Curtis Brooks. It was either Curtis Brooks or Elijah Ponder. There was a fumble forced in recovery late in the game. And I remember saying on air, uh, the defensive line, a question mark going into the season, you can turn that into an exclamation point tonight because they were just so good in that game. They forced pressure on Dorian Thompson Robinson. They got to him, sacked him. They flushed him out of the pocket. They made him flustered. I mean, he was not good that night. Largely due to the defensive line, the Bearcats got a great push on UCLA's offensive line. And I remember thinking after that game, okay, the defensive line is fine. There was not a star player on that defensive line. What there was, was a collective unit of players. Curtis Brooks, Elijah Ponder, Ethan Tucky, Brian Wright, 
MyJ Sanders, Michael Pitts, um, Jabari Taylor, Malik Van. You can throw in a bunch, you can throw in a whole slew of players who were major contributors to the Bearcats' success in the defensive line. Marcus Brown, another one. There were so many players on that unit that there didn't have to be a star player. There didn't have to be that guy who had 13 and a half sacks. There didn't have to, there didn't have to be a player who had, I don't know, 10 tackles for loss. No, it was all a collective unit. And you saw it in the UCF game when the rotation of players, 22 different defensive players saw the field in that game. A lot of them were on the defensive line. So if this Bearcats defensive line, which has guys that include Malik Van, Jawan Briggs, Jabari Taylor, if they can have that production plus production from other players to step up, this is still going to be a strength of this team. And I do believe it will be. I mean, you got Noah Potter, who just committed in the transfer portal to hopefully pick up the loss of Mike J. Sanders to the NFL draft. So there is hope that this defensive line can pick up right where it, you know, left off. So we look at the roster, and we see the defensive linemen that are on it. Should have had this pulled up before the show started. So we look at the def- we look at the defensive line, and we see... Um, you know, Malik Van, Juwan Briggs, I already mentioned. You know, you got um, Chase Brown, Dominic Perry, Eric, Eric Phillips, Michael Keyes, Noah Potter, Mario Eugenio, Tyler Gillison, you know, Ryan Mullaney, Isaiah Rufin, uh, Jamal Williams, Justin Woodley, Derek Shepard. These are guys who have been here for a long time. You know, I'm going, I'm going through the list. I'm seeing a lot of juniors, seniors, graduate students. So that's good. You have experience. And defensive line this year coached by Walter Stewart, who comes from Temple, which I actually like. Walter Stewart, of course, played for Cincinnati, um, played for UC from 2008 through 2012, team captain, second team all, all Big East as a senior in 2012, played in 43 games four Big East championships, so five years, about as successful of a career as you can ever have. And at Cincinnati, not named Tony Pike, Desmond Ritter, Greg Cook, Gino Caduli, etc. Um, or Marty Gilliard. 2019 through 21 was Temple's uh, defensive line coach. So you're getting someone who's familiar with the conference. You're getting someone who comes from a culture in Temple who you know is really good at, you know, in the trenches. I mean, Temple tough. Come on. So I like that. And you're asking, the, the, the key about this year's defense is you're asking guys, like players I just mentioned, and these guys have played here before, but the one thing you're asking them to do, to steal a phrase from Mick Cronin, is when they get on the bus, they're the ones deciding whether or not they're winning the game. You know, maybe Malik Van Juwan Briggs and company weren't the players deciding who was going to win games last year for this team. This year, it's they are the ones. If they can generate pressure, if they can win at the line of scrimmage, which is where the Bearcats will win a lot, will win a lot of games this year. If they can do that, they're going to be the ones impacting the game. They're going to be the one wrecking the opposing offense's game plan. That's what needs to happen from those guys this year. You know, the thing is, though, these guys have played before. Like, you look at last year's stats. I just mentioned Malik Van. You look at last year's stats. Malik Van. Sorry. Um, well, I just got away from them. You look at guys Van and Juwan Briggs. They, I mean, they combined last year for, what was it? Um, where is Juwan Briggs here? Malik Van had three and a half sacks. Juwan Briggs had three. They combined for six and a half sacks. Tackles for loss. Malik Van eight and a half. Juwan Briggs four. That's 12 and a half tackles for loss. So it's not like that they're not used to playing. They're just not used to being the ones when the spotlight goes on, when the lights go on, they're the ones deciding the outcome of the game. They will be this year. And you look at Jabari Taylor, for instance. Arguably saved the season last year with his goal line stands against Tulsa. Malik's Van, Malik Van's production was overlooked last year with Curtis Brooks, Sanders, and Sauce. 
but I thought he was still very productive. It's almost like Malik Van. Remember when he was one of the highly one of the most highly touted recruits of the fickle era? And we heralded him? We've forgotten about him, but this year you won't be able to because you know, you know this year he's going to have to step up. You know this year he's going to have to be one of the players who decides if the Bearcats are winning today, which more often than not, I think they will. Up next, so what's the one thing the defensive line needs to do? There's one thing in particular that the interior linemen need to do for the defensive line to be a success and a strength of this team. I'll tell you what that is after a word from two of our sponsors. Something I've noticed of recent, this is not just with the Bearcats, this is college, this is overall college football, the NFL. A majority of your sacks are coming from the outside of the def- on the defensive line. It's coming from edge rushers. You know, you look at, you know, what teams are prioritizing around football. It's edge rushers. It's so important to have someone who can come off the edge, breeze by an offensive lineman, and get to the quarterback, especially from the quarterback's blind side. But what's equally as important, and I think even more important, is if you have those interior linemen. Because to me, if I'm a quarterback, I don't want a 300-pound lineman landing on top of me. I can live with someone coming off the edge. That's fine. What I wouldn't want to have is a 300-pound lineman landing on top of me, and I'm staring him down right in the face. But if you're if you're on defense, if you can get a push up the middle, if you can collapse the pocket, that's a huge advantage. As college football becomes more and more speed-oriented, and edge rushers become more of a priority than defensive tackles, like you look at the top defensive prospects over the years, where have they come from? Corner or the edge, right? Look at this year, Derek Stingley Jr., Sauce Gardner, Trayvon Walker, linebacker, but you get the point. We're seeing more and more of an emphasis put on speed on defense. But defensive linemen can be just as equally effective in the interior. They can be difference makers. Why? Because the pocket, excuse me, collapses. If you're able to, you know, if you're able to do that. And then what happens when the pocket breaks down? Plays break down, right? You know, I understand that quarterbacks are more dynamic in football today than they were 10, 15 years ago. But still, when a play breaks down, I'm not, and I'm not trying to sound like a, you know, X's and O's aficionado analyst. Because I understand the common person probably listening to this podcast doesn't want me to give them an X's and O's lesson right now. But I'm saying to you, if you're a defensive lineman and you can collapse the pocket and force the quarterback outside of it, scramble, off script, that adds an element. If you're if you're a fan of offense, you're holding your breath for A, hoping the quarterback doesn't get sacked, and B, that he doesn't throw a Brett Favre-like interception. If you're a member of the defense, now you still fear on the you still fear when a quarterback escapes the pocket that he's going to find a running lane, he's going to get yards, maybe a first down, maybe more. But you still, if you force a quarterback out of the pocket, you're feeling good because then it's like, okay, if you give up a big play, so be it. Guy made a play, give him credit. More often than not, that you're going to find a way to get him down. I don't care how dynamic the quarterback is, though. I don't care. Because you want him to be comfortable. You want him to be uncomfortable in the pocket. That's where script goes according to plan. But if you're a defensive lineman, you need to collapse the pocket. Get that push up the middle. So then the edge rushers can then chase the quarterback once it gets out of, once it gets out of the pocket. And that'll win the battle at the line of scrimmage. It's not just quarterback, though. Running backs, for instance. You know, the running game is still important in football today, even though we've seen these explosive offenses. The running game is still important. I mean, look at the Big 12. They have an emphasis of running the football. You heard John Garcia Jr. mention this on my show a few weeks ago. Running back is a position of target priority going into the Big 12 for Cincinnati. And the reason why is because you need to be able to run the football. But think about it from this perspective. If you're able to push 
and win the battle at the line of scrimmage. You're going to hold a running back to one yard, two yards, as opposed to four or five yards, and that's a huge difference. You want to know why every snap of every game is so important and why every snap and every play is dissected by our good friends at Pro Football Focus? Because every play does matter. Second and six or five is a lot better than second and eight or nine. Because then you can tee off if you're a defensive line. Edge rushers, yes, are a huge priority. But you also need defensive linemen to win the battle at the line of scrimmage, both in the passing game and the run game, which Cincinnati has been successful at. The one problem with this, though, the one problem with this is that Cincinnati plays a 3-3-5 defense. So there's already one defensive lineman taken away from you, right? You have an edge rusher and then two down linemen, maybe only one down lineman. If they went to a 4-3, which I think they should do, or even a 4-4, like they went against Navy, and it worked. If they go 4-3, I'd feel a lot better about it. Because then you have two defensive linemen. Right now, with a 3-3-5, you're saying, okay, we're taking away either a D lineman or a D end. I don't like that. And you saw it against against Alabama last year in the Cotton Bowl. The only complaint, one of the very few complaints outside of Mike Denbrock, one complaint I saw from fans last year when I would browse through comments in the athletic, social media, was why are we playing a 3-3-5? Why are we letting opposing teams just eat our whatevers in the run game? And to their to their credit, they were right. Because the, the, the Bearcats' defense last year against the run at times, leaky. You saw it against Alabama, and you saw it against Tulsa, and you saw it against South Florida. There were games last year where the Bearcats' defensive line was just bulldozed over, and you felt like it shouldn't have been that way, and yet it was. So that's why this year the emphasis on Malik Van and Jawan Briggs generating that push. The problem is, though, again, are both those guys going to be on the field at the same time? If you go 3-3-5, and you choose to have two defensive ends and only one down lineman, Van and Briggs won't be on the field at the same time. If you go 3-3-5 and say, okay, we're going to keep one edge rusher, only one edge rusher, Noah Potter should be, and Malik, Van, and Juwan Briggs, that's fine. If you go 4-3, you're guaranteed two of each. Two down linemen and then two linemen who are in a stance like they're going to rush the quarterback. I don't 335. I really don't. It worked for one game and it may have worked for a few years. But I think if you're Mike Tressel, and they probably won't change it, but I think they should consider it. Even if the quarterback is dynamic, as soon as you escape the pocket, you start thinking, oh my gosh, what if he does something? That's where you want your extra edge rusher if you decide to take one off. It, it, playing 335 is unique, it works. But at the same time, you got to make a crucial decision. And then you only have three linebackers. And then most of your players are in the secondary, and they're 10 to 15 yards downfield already as it is. The best way to prevent a quarterback from escaping the pocket and making plays in that way is if you have a defensive lineman or a defensive line that can push and get to the quarterback. Have that, and this defense could be just as good as last year's team. Juwan Briggs last year, 42 tackles, three sacks, four tackles for loss. You look at other interior defensive line numbers. Malik Van already mentioned his and Briggs. Three and a half t- sacks, eight and a half tackles for loss, three passes defended, one fumble recovery. The only problem with the defenses, and I think it's kind of holding them back now, and we saw this against Alabama last year in the Cotton Bowl, was they play 3 3 5. A team can literally say, guys, we're not passing much today. We're going to run the football because we know we can. Five offensive linemen, sometimes six versus three. Easy mismatch, right? There you go. On tomorrow's show, five bold predictions. It's another bold prediction Tuesday. Haven't really done one in a while. Five bold predictions, defense line, and then Friday. Friday's July 1st. Next year on July 1st, the Bearcats will officially join the Big 12. So, what are seven things that the Bearcats need to do and what we need to see from both football and and men's basketball. So when July 1st, 2023 rolls around, 
The Cincinnati Bearcats are ready to go in the Big 12. Don't forget to follow us on or subscribe to the Lockdown Bearcats channel on YouTube, which at last count is up to 229 subscribers and counting. Don't forget to follow us to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. You can also follow me on Twitter at Frankie underscore 90 with two N's and N-A-T-I. You can follow me on Instagram, AlexFrank9 underscore, or email me at Alex3Frank at gmail.com. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. Hey, speaking of the Big 12, why don't you go make Lockdown Big 12 your second listen every day? Host Josh Neighbors, good friend of mine, and the local experts of Lockdown take you across the Big 12 in 30 minutes. Lockdown Big 12, your second listen of every day. That's Lockdown Big 12. For the Lockdown Bearcats podcast, my name is Alex Frank. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. Have a great rest of your Monday, June 27th. How are we already at June 27th? I don't know. Time flies. Anyway, I'll be back tomorrow with a whole new episode, five bold predictions on the defensive line of the Cincinnati Bearcats. Until then, thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. I'm Alex Frank. Have a great rest of your Monday.